Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Jaguars and Wildlife of Brazil's Pantanal, a photographer's checklist. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Fernando Lessa. Fernando, thank you so much for being here today and for taking us with you to the Pantanal. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you, Sunny. Thank everyone for tuning in. Um, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy. We're going to be talking about what you bring to make the most of the, the trip and, you know, get some amazing images because the Pantanal is, is really a remarkable place. Okay, so let's uh, start. There you go. So I'm a natural history documentary storyteller biologist and I'm a expedition leader with NatHab. Um, I've been guiding with NatHab for um, some time and I guide primarily in uh, Pantanal. So the Pantanal is the largest wetlands in the world. So it's an amazing place. The wildlife is abundant in all sorts, forms and shapes you can never imagine from uh, birds, um, mammals, small, big, large, it's an amazing place. And it's also a very isolated area. So the nearest camera shop is around 2000 kilometers away in Sao Paulo, which is uh, where you arrive. And even there, it's not a very reliable place to look for photography gear. So whatever you're planning to bring, you have to bring it from home. You know, uh, being in an expedition, being in the Pantanal, it really requires you to be, you know, independent in that sense, bring your gear, know what you bring in and be familiar with it is very, very important. So what should you bring to make the most out of the trip? So you're gonna uh, be going over some um, some of the basic gear that I think it would be very helpful to have and also some small gadgets and small things that I think will make your life and your trip more enjoyable. So cameras, uh, when you got in there, a lot of, you see all sorts of cameras and people always ask, what's the best camera? The best camera is the one that is available. If it's a GoPro, it's an iPhone, if it's a super modern mirrorless, whatever, the best camera is the one that is available and ready to take a picture. So. If you don't have the newest camera or if you don't feel like, you know, investing a lot of camera or just using something that you have, it's no problem. The important is you have to have your camera ready and available. That's the best gear to have. So uh, nowadays we have a lot of discussions between uh, DSLR and mirrorless. It's a long debate. So just go over. So DSLR uh, is a digital version of the old film cameras we use. So there's the film that goes on the back, then the light comes and you, have, you can see here in, in, in this model here on the left, the red, uh, sorry, the blue thing, that's the mirror. So the light comes, reflect on the mirror and then in the penta mirror and then reflects to the viewer what you see it. And when you press the shutter, the mirror goes down and expose the film. Um, with a DSLR, which is a digital SLR, it's very much the same, but instead of having the film, you have the image sensor. You have the light coming through, reaching the mirror, then reflects in the penta mirror, and then you have the viewer. And when you press the shutter, basically that uh, mirror goes uh, down and expose the sensor. So, um, a few years ago, we started seeing mirrorless cameras, which basically uh, works in a different, it's a little bit more uh, simple thing, just less moving parts. So the light comes and and um, enrich the sensor. And also the image you view, it's a digital image that is generated uh, by the same light. So you don't have this mirror that goes up and down, which is really good because you're much more quiet and there's way less moving parts, which is also very good. If you, in an expedition, you wanna be sure whatever you have is a very sturdy gear. And I personally favor nowadays mirrorless just because they're more straightforward and they have, they've been performing amazingly uh, over the years. 
So here's some difference. So both cameras are very reliable. Uh, DSLR has been around for maybe 20, 20 something years. Mirrorless are newer in the market. I think they started getting really popular in the last five years, but both are very reliable cameras. Uh, DSLR tends to be a little bit larger than the mirrorless because they have to have this mirror. Um, so if the size is something, definitely uh, mirrorless are smaller if you have smaller hands. Um, their mirrorless could be a good opportunity. And also since mirrorless don't have this mirror up going down, they're super quiet. Actually, nowadays, most of the camera has a feature that they're absolutely quiet. They make no noise at all, which could be very helpful when you work with wildlife, right? You know, when you see that's the thing in the TV, like click, 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 thousands of photographers. That sometimes can be stressful for wildlife. So having a quiet camera is also a good thing. Um, DSLR, they tend to drain batteries faster because they have the moving parts. And also since they have a kind of older technology, they may, they don't use the battery as efficient as mirrorless. So something also to consider. Uh, and mirrorless, since they have like a newer technology, they tend to perform amazing in long light, which is very, very important for us because we're using long lenses and sometimes dark, you know, you, you, you can't really choose when the jaguars or any cool wildlife will show up. So having a camera that performs in low light is very, very important. Um, I remember 10 years ago, if you have to take a picture with uh, 6400 ISO with a DSLR, very unlikely going to be used, able to use those images. They'll be too grainy. And nowadays, I can shoot uh, 6400 uh, 6, ISO with my mirrorless, no problem whatsoever. So, you know, that's a really, really good point for mirrorless. If you're considering buying a camera, I think this is one of the key things. Um, as I mentioned, the SLR, they make some noise. Um, mirrorless don't. And also another really good thing on mirrorless, is they really have good connectivity with cell phones. So a lot of the cameras, you can connect to your phone remotely. So you can just put your camera like in a tripod and, and press the shutter remotely, which is good if you're working in the landscapes, that's very handy. Or sometimes, you know, you see a bird that's kind of shy, you can leave your camera in a tripod and just have a live feed on your phone and, and work it remotely. So it's very, very cool. Disconnectivity is something I've been using a lot in my work. And of course, DSLR, they tend to be cheaper than mirrorless. I wouldn't say much more, but it's common to see something 30 or 20% cheaper than mirrorless, especially because there's newer, there's less newer models available. And so, you know, if, if your budget's something to consider, definitely DSLRs are, are the way to go. But again, don't get me wrong, both cameras are amazing. And I really don't think you would be limited because you have one or not another. It's just different uh, features that they offer. So to run the cameras, you need batteries. Uh, I like to, to bring uh, three batteries for the trip. Uh, in the Pantanal, you're gonna see you leave early in the morning, spend the day, go back for lunch, then you have a small break and then you go out again in the afternoon. So I like to have two batteries. Why? I use one battery in the morning, one battery in the afternoon, and I have a spare battery all the time. So in when I'm lunch break, I don't need to worry about if I'm going to be, uh, if I forgot to charge the battery or something. So I always have one I'm going to use. I don't need to bother about charging. I use one in the afternoon and I still have a spare just in case. And, it, you know, it's not a bad idea to bring that spare battery with you. You know, batteries are super resistant. As long as they kept dry, it's so good. And something that I highly recommend is only buy batteries of the same brand of your cameras. Uh, nowadays, a lot of the manufacturers, when you put a different brand in your, uh, in your camera, they just give you an error message. Uh, I know there's brands, off brands, they do good batteries but you can't guarantee the compatibility with your camera. So I've seen issues with that happen and it's hard. You never know what are the quality standards for that. So I would highly recommend buying original batteries. Usually when you buy the camera, it comes one 
um, and you can just easily uh, purchase two more if you if you're coming for the trip. That's something I highly recommend. And nowadays, uh, most camera run uh, runs on lithium batteries, which is lithium is a formidable component, and they allow uh, the batteries to last way longer. Uh, back in time, you could even get some uh, DSLRs that run on double A batteries, triple A's, and etc. But lithium is definitely the way to go. So, you know, that's something to consider as well. And most of the cameras uh, nowadays, most of the batteries are lithium. And that's something to think about. The downside is that lithium does not behave well with water. Uh, there's a lot of issues you can easily find out on the internet. When lithium batteries get in contact with water, they may ignite. So be very diligent and be very careful. Keep your batteries dry and protected in the case. And also a lot of the batteries nowadays, they have like really small contacts that connects to the camera. So you should drop a battery, for example, in the dirt, etc. cetera. Um, it's not gonna affect the battery, but you may get those contacts there and you may get some, you know, some sand there and et cetera. And that can definitely affect the connection with the camera. So keep your camera, keep your batteries dry, have a protected case. That's, uh, that's the way to go. And also, please follow aviation rules when flying with those batteries, especially if you're flying from the US, they are extremely, extremely, you know, careful about that. Bring the, follow, just, you know, do your research. The company will be flying. Usually they require you to fly with your batteries in the cabin. So please follow those rules. There have been accidents back in time, but, most, uh, most, if not all, camera batteries are safe. You know, there's no problem, but just make sure to double check the right, uh, the regulations. And charger, that's a small component. Then you know it's very important. And if you don't have a good charger, it's gonna, it's gonna be hard for you. So um, modern chargers are fast and super reliable. Most of the time, you can charge two batteries at a time. And I'm not super crazy about the brands. So you have to have original chargers. Usually I buy the, the batteries original from the same brand of my camera, but I'm a, I'm a more flexible with the charger. Most of them nowadays come, you can charge two batteries at a time and they have a blinking sensor that you get screen, so it's, it's full. So I think that's the way to go. And I tend to favor a chargers that have a USB plug because it is it is it easy, right? In Brazil, you see I put a picture here of the, the plug. It's a very unique plug. I think it's the only find in Italy or something. So you may forget the adapter or something like that. But if you have a USB, you know, as long as you can charge your phone, you'll be able to charge your battery. So I highly recommend getting a, a USB charger connector. And now sensor cleaning. That's another thing that you know it's very important. So our sensors, the DSLR and the mirrorless, they run on high voltage. So uh, especially when you get dry and warm climate, that electricity running the sensor tends to attract a lot of small particles. So that's something you happen, may happen in the Pantanal, especially when you're changing lens, there's a little bit of wind and stuff. It's very common to get dirt in your sensor. Uh, back to sensor cleaning. So um, this is, for example, uh, an issue you can, you can like, this is your dust in the sensor and that can happen different. You know, it can get small particles you have, can get dust on your lens, on your sensor, etc. And, you know, you can definitely um, fix that in post-production, you no know, Lightroom and Photoshop. But, you know, if you get that dust right in the eye of the Jaguar, it's going to be very hard to clean. So, you know, I, there's some options for you to kind of mitigate that problem. So for a quick clean, you know, just changing lens and you get like a small dust and stuff, those hand blowers are super fine. They're very cheap, it's just a rubber thing, you know, not uh, nothing, no, no crazy gear. And you can just kind of blow it a little bit when you change the lens and that is fine for a lot of time. But sometimes, you know, it gets, bad and those blowers are not enough. So nowadays you can get uh, those cleaner kits. So 
it's basically like a kind of shaped swab for you to kind of um, clean the sensor. And back in time, there was something very complex, you know, and most people would not feel okay doing at home and you have to send to a shop to get a clinic, but nowadays it's absolutely fine. Um, just, uh, just be sure to buy one of those uh, cleaner kits, just do a little bit of research on how to use, it's very easy. And you just put a liquid and um, swab it. But the only point is make sure when you bind it to, that you bind uh, the right size of your sensor. So either it's a full frame, uh, if it's an APS or a different size of sensor, you can find those in most sizes. So just be sure, because if you have a smaller one, then it's okay. But if you have a larger one, it will be very hard. So something to consider. And they're they're definitely not expensive, very easy to maintain, you know, just buy the kit and put it in the in the bag. And you know, they last long, come quite a few swabs. So I think it's something I highly recommend bringing. And also um some lens cleaning kits. We always, you know, you're gonna be out in the sun, it's warm, you're using like sunscreen, bug spray, and all that. So your hands sometimes your 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 get your uh, hands get dirt. So or you know you get some water in uh, in your uh, front element and stuff. So I highly recommend uh, having a lens cleaning kit. You don't need to bring the sensor cleaning kit to the boat. Actually, I don't recommend you bring it because you're not gonna use there. But a lens cleaning kit is is very handy to have in a boat with you. So you can you can get different varieties you have the the lens cleaning paper uh zines do this really cool kit that comes it's a little bit more um products or just a small cloth and mind that this is the same stuff you use to to clean your um sunglasses or so you can kind of use that and also i just kind of recommend if you're getting a liquid kit uh, I would stick to famous brand like Zines, Tiffin and stuff, just in case, you know, you know exactly what's in that liquid and you're not um, risking anything. And mine, these are for lens, not for the sensor, right? It's different products, different applications, something to be aware of. And then memory cards. Uh, nowadays we have, I don't even know how many, uh, we have all shapes, sizes, and forms. Um, and I recommend investing on this because they fail. Unfortunately, um, we look at them, and if you if you not take if you don't take a lot of pictures all the time, maybe you never had a memory card failure. But it happens. It happens to me many times. So nowadays, my camera, which a lot of the mirrorless cameras do, they offer two slots. So basically, one and a backup. So if your camera offers that, I highly recommend you running a backup just in case. But if you have just one slot, just make sure choose established brands. And a lot of those uh, good brands, when you buy the card, just look on the back and they also come with a link for you to download a uh, recover software. If your card stop working or get corrupted, those softwares are lifesaver. And they work really well when you can save every, most of the time everything that is in your card. And the good thing is, if you just I imagine that you bought a card that doesn't have, that doesn't come with those softwares and you have a corrupted card, it's really expensive. It's not uncommon to have like 20, 30 bucks for a gig of files recovered. So if you buy a memory card for 50 bucks and it comes with a free recover software, that's a really good deal. And it's handy, right? You don't have to wait the trip with a card and then go back, send it to someone to have those rest with. You can basically run that in your uh, laptop if you have to have one with you. And unless you were like a crazy shooter, you know, someone that goes back in the morning and takes 5,000 pictures, I highly recommend you pay for cheaper smaller and slower cards you don't need to have those the most fastest one unless you're shooting video and if you have small cards and it gets full you just put another one if you have like a 128 gig like this card this is my card case but i use that for video as well so that's why you have those huge cards but if you have a huge card and gets corrupted you lose everything 
if you have a small card and it gets corrupted, you just maybe lose a day, of, like a morning or something. So I highly recommend you go smaller cards and just, you know, change them often. And don't forget the card readers. Uh, if you happen to have a, a, a laptop with you, I highly recommend you doing a backup every day by the end of the day. So you go out in the morning, change your card, go back in the afternoon, use a different card. Then after dinner, you can sit around, download your cards. You know, if you if you save it on your computer or if you have a hard drive, you know, just make a, a backup every day. And I think that's a that's the way to go. Really, I don't recommend you having a lot of days in your cards. Uh, unfortunately, we have some some clients last trip. They had their whole trip in a single card, and that card was not really working well. So you know that's a kind of risk. So bring a few cards, bring a a card reader, and nowadays you can have this card reader that they can take all sorts of memory cards, even memory sticks. So you know, it's a it's a handy tool nowadays to to have with you, and they are small, portable, and, and very cheap. And now lenses, lenses is a big thing, and I recommend you. That's where you really should invest if you if you're considering uh, getting serious in photography. So as we have with cameras, we have mirrorless and DSLR. In in lens, we have zoom lens or prime lens, which is basically Amazing optics and convenience. Zoom lens are very convenient and prime lens are amazing optics. Oh, there you go. So zoom lens, um, you can see the diagram here. So it's a system of uh, lens element that kind of move back and forth and offer you a variety of uh, focal length. So you can have a wide angle and a very long zoom in a single lens. So they're very practical, they're very flexible, they tend to be compact and cheaper than prime lenses. Um, but it's something to consider. Whatever you have, imagine you you see that beautiful Jaguar. So anything that's in between your Jaguar and your camera sensor will affect the quality of your image. By no means I'm saying that you can get good images with a zoom lens, not at all. You do, you're gonna get amazing images. But for you to have this uh, flexibility of different uh, lengths, you have a lot of uh, glass element and they will affect the images. So that's why usually with prime lenses, you get a nicer bouquet and you tend to get nicer images, but um, you, know, you have the, the flexibility of zoom. I'm a zoom guy. I have a variety of zoom lens and I'm super happy with the quality of the images, but you know, depends on what kind of photography or how serious you are, it's something to consider in getting a um, fixed lens. So what you look for in the zoom lenses? Um, this picture here, that's the largest, uh, the biggest zoom lens you can find in the market. I think it's like a 500, 2000 millimeters. Um, this picture here is a joke. You, you definitely can use that camera handheld. You need a tripod and a big one. I think that that lens weights around like 20 something kilos. So that's just a, it's not a real one. And so what do you look for in a zoom lens? So look for weather sealed ones. A lot of brands they offer, they will have one line that's slightly cheaper, that's not water sealed. And then they have one that's uh, a little bit more expensive that can hold a little bit of water, humidity and stuff. If you go in the Pantanal, that's very important because um, not weather sealed uh, zoom lens, they can get dust inside. If you if you get like a very dry season, etc., it's something cons to consider since those are most lenses made for you to use indoors in a studio and they have an outdoor version that's sealed. Um, also, Try to stick to native brands. Uh, nowadays, you have a variety of brands that, like, usually, for example, the camera manufacturers they have their own line of lenses, and also you have third brands that do lenses. All of them tend to work really, really well. But when you're talking to really long zoom lenses, the communication between the lens and the camera is very important. So if you uh, if you're purchasing a very 
long zoom lens, for example, you want to have the best autofocus. And nowadays, the having the uh, the lens, the same brand of your camera, it helps this communication between lens and camera, so you can get a better performance. But of course, they tend to be a little bit more expensive, but it's something to consider. Um, go for brighter lenses. So the ones that give you, it gets more light, they have wider apertures. And of course, they tend to be more expensive, but they are more flexible. You need less light to achieve the results you're looking for. And also avoid manual lenses. That's my recommendation. Um, if you're shooting video in a tripod, manual lenses tend to be fine. But most of the time in the Pantanal, if not all times, you're going to be in a boat. The boat you know, may not be super stable. There'll be more gas and water and everything moving. So manual lenses, they are very hard. Don't get me wrong, you can get good results, at, but it will make your life a little bit harder. So I will try to, to get digital lenses. And for the Pantanal, since you know we, it, we always have some distance from the animal to respect it, either birds or um, any wildlife, jaguars and etc. So when you know most of the time you cannot get too close. So for the best results, if you're considering uh, purchasing or if you're bringing, if you don't know what lens to bring, I recommend you bring in a zoom lens that's like at least 300 millimeters in length. Some models I recommend and some models I've I've seen uh, in the field and are really good. Uh, I like the Sony, the 200-600. That's the one I have. It's really good. The Nikon 200-500 is also a very famous lens and it has the VR. So um, the, the lens itself has a computer that's, that helps you stabilize and that definitely helps you get in sharper pictures. Um, the Canon, the 100-400, the EF, that's a classic. It's considered one of the best uh, zoom lens ever made. Uh, if you just bought the new Canon cameras, the mirrorless from Canon, they call RF mounts. They released the 200-800. I never used the lens, but I heard amazing things. So I think it's it's definitely worth. Um, then you have the Fuji, the 100-400. Uh, I've seen one of our guides, uh, Zappa, which is, is a legend in the Pantanal. And he was working with this uh, lens and I was amazed by the results you can see his uh, his instagram is really really good lens and you know it li literally deliv delivers sharp images and then you have the sigma the 100 600 that's a much cheaper lens it's really good one I i've used it for a couple of years but of course this lens for example it goes for ha almost half price of the sony so you know you you're missing something in terms of optics and stuff but you will be able to get amazing images. I did one of my trips uh, this year with the with the 100 600. Actually, this Jaguar you see here in the slide was taken with that lens. So, you know, if you if you don't want to invest that much, I think that's one of the lens, and they make they make this for all sorts of uh, camera brands. So prime lens, so it's a fixed lens. They tend to perform better light uh, in low light. They have an amazing, amazing uh, optical quality since they don't have all those elements. So there's less glass. Um, they're very expensive. They're heavy and they're bulky, but they're amazing. So if you're into birding photography or if you really want to get it serious in, in, in wildlife, I'm sure you're going to consider that at some point. But by no means you have to have it. I know there's some um, places that offer rentals for lenses. I think even uh, NatHab um, can recommend you some some places. And you know maybe renting if you never tried one of those lenses, maybe renting one for the trip is a, is a good thing. They're not for everyone, but they are really good. You know if you're serious into it, I highly recommend a look into them. And later you have teleconverters. So if you already have your lens and you don't have a really long lens and you like to have more flexibility, you can use teleconverter, which are small lenses that basically they they double or sometimes they double, sometimes it's 1.4 times, they kind of make your zoom longer. So if for example, you have like a 700, 200 sitting around, that's like, oh, I don't feel buying a new lens, you can buy a teleconverter, of course, 
there's the downsides. You adding more elements, it may affect uh, the quality a little bit. It makes may make the autofocus a little bit more uncertain. But it's a it's a good alternative, and uh, we use that all the time. And even if you have like a 600, like, and if you I want to have a longer lens, that's the way to go. They're not uh, too expensive. And again, I highly recommend getting one from the same brand of your camera and lenses, so you uh, we have better communication. So um, telelenses, as, as I mentioned, try to stick to 200 millimeters and longer, and the brighter, the more expensive, but they are more flexible. And also be mindful about the length of your lens. Um, that's the reason why you don't shoot a wildlife with telescopes. Handheld a lens when you're shooting is tricky. So, and there's a kind of rule for that. So let's say you're shooting with a 200 millimeter lens, you try to have your speed, your shutter speed, at least one 200th uh, um, of a second in speed. If you shoot any slower than that, it's very likely you're gonna not gonna get the sharpest picture. So if you really if you're using a really long lens, just be mindful that you're gonna have to work around the speed that you can actually shoot, or you can bring a monopod that kind of helps you. So we talked about zoom lens. Now we're gonna talk about normal lenses, which is they, they tend to be more compact, and we call them normal because they try to simulate um, the regular um, angle of view that the human eyes have. So usually we consider uh, them between 35 millimeters to 50 millimeters. They're very simple construction, very few uh, glass elements. So and they tend to be cheaper and very fast. So I think it's a very helpful uh, uh, lens to have. And also they're usually very bright, so you can find them from f1.2, even 0.95, 1.4, they're very bright. So it's always a nice uh, lens to have. And this one, since they are faster and they have less glass element, you usually can play around a little bit and try different brands. So, you know, you don't have to commit to the Nikon, if you have a Nikon camera, you can try different brands. And even you can try um, manual ones. You know, you have a variety of brands nowadays. So these are really cool, very fast and it's small. So it works perfect for a quick snap. And also um, they're very helpful for social photography. So you might be doing the Aura Safari in the Aurora's Lodge and then you see the Pantaneros walking around or if you see people working around, they're really used, very helpful for social photography. Uh, street photographers use them all the time. And as I mentioned, they try to be very bright. So 1.2, 1.4, 1.82. So I highly recommend having one of them. Um, that's a lens that I kind of would consider, for example, when you leave the hotel, you, you hop on the boat until you start, uh, when you're traveling to the location where you're gonna be looking for the Jaguars, it's a nice a lens to have around. You know, it's, if you see some landscape, it's a it's a quick one. Oh, sorry guys. Back here, perfect. Wide angle lens. When you're talking about wildlife, people always think about really long lens and getting that perfect portrait, but wide angle lens are very important. So they tend um, to cover, they're, um, I say they're an amazing lens to kind of introduce the viewer to what's going on. And usually you consider wide angle lens when they from 24 to 35 millimeters, then you have super wider. But um, it's focal and wide angle lens. And I noticed that a lot of people don't, you know, either they don't bring them or they don't use them that often. So for example, this picture here, um, we were in, uh, in the Cuyaba River and we were shooting this Jaguar and it was just sitting there beautiful. And we have him for like half an hour. And everyone with their big zoom lens and taking that really nice portrait, which is great. but you know, if if someone was showing me the pictures, I would see that like, okay, where is this Jaguar, right? You you like you you need to kind of situate the viewer and say, yeah, it was in the river, and you see the vegetation, and you see how it camouflaged, 
And that's the stuff you can only get with wide angle lens. So I highly recommend bringing one with you. And here is a really cool example. So of course, there's Temple for a landscape kit, but also they also they enable you to get establishing shots. So for example, we have this Jaguars, this sequence here. So it's the same animal. And we are going back in the hotel. We, we thought that the day was done. Uh, and then we go the stern and then boom, there's this beautiful Jaguar sitting on the beach. And again, every one of their really cool zoom lenses. But it's like, yeah, where is the Jaguar? You know, we have an amazing sunset. The lighting was beautiful. And a lot of, um, you could see a lot of boats coming by and they would not see the Jaguar. And I thought I was like, oh, I, I need to, to tell the story. Like this guy was sitting here just like relaxing and a lot of people going around and not seeing it, you know? So I think they're amazing tools to, to give a wide perspective. And I, I think they're, it's something to have handy, you know, if you have the opportunity to, to be with a Jaguar for a long time, once you get your narrow shots with your long lens, I think it's a really good idea to have a wide lens, wide angle lens and just get some wider shots to show where this beautiful animal lives. And of course you can later on use it for um, some landscape, you can get some beautiful night shots with it. So it's a, it's a very flexible one. Some models I recommend. So um, I recommend the 24105 um, Sony. That's not very a wide angle one. It's a, it's a kind of wide zoom, but for me it's the most flexible uh, length. And I really like this lens. Um, I've also been using the Tamron, uh, the 1728 millimeters. Again, since it's not like a, it's a wide angle, it's like a much deeper, uh, shallow, much bigger uh, um, depth of field. So out of focus is not like a crazy thing. I I use the Tamron and I'm super happy with. And then you have the classics, the Nikkor, the 1625, uh, either the four or the 2.8. This is an amazing lens. It's been around, of course they renewed the project, but it's been around a long time. It's, it's solid, rock solid. Uh, the Canon version of that, the 1635, is also another um, beautiful lens. The Fuji ones, uh, the 1655, is also another really uh, solid lens. And the Sigma, the 1835, this is, is another one. Um, Sigma makes a lens that fits a variety of brands, so you can buy this lens in a version of your camera. And it's super sharp. Um, I have one, I use it a lot. But just be mindful, this is a kind of big camera, so it's something to, to consider. Sorry, a bigger, bigger lens. And what I would call the perfect uh, kit you have around, so I would have a wide angle lens, like a short zoom, so something between uh, 16 and 35 millimeters. Uh, a medium range lens, something between 24 and 70 or 24, 105, and a really long zoom that's gonna be used to get that nice cool portrait of the Jaguars, you know. And if it's within your budget, you can have, uh, for example, a 7200, and then you have like a fixed lens that you only use for that special situation. So, but I think I personally think you'd be very fine having a wide angle, a medium, and a long zoom. And some gadgets. Uh, so our trips are strictly no drones. Um, they are not allowed in the Pantanal. We're gonna be working in a park, so no uh, no drones there. And also Brazilian legislation is super strict uh, with drone uh, um, regulation. So even if you're extending your trip, you're going somewhere else in Brazil, I highly do not recommend flying drones um, over there. So yeah. And now I'd like to go some over some small accessories and gadgets that. I think would make your expedition more enjoyable. So flashes, they're really cool tools to freeze action and feel light. So if you're shooting like in a very harsh light that you get those hard uh, shadows, a flash is a really good tool. Something to consider is there's a distance that they are effective. If you are 30 meters from, from your subject, there's no flash in the world that will be able to to reach the subject that far. So you need some distance to work. Also, you have to be mindful about other gas. So imagine you're in a boat with 
eight other gas, and then you have this beautiful Jaguar that's not too far. If you, if, and everyone starts shooting, if you get your flash on, you're gonna end, like the other gas, we end up getting that light in your shots as well. So it's something to be mindful, you know, because they may not like that. And also, um, some animals get very disturbed by flash. So um, I know it's a kind of hot topic using flash for birds. Um, I know some cats are not very comfortable with flash and some mammals also not very uh, comfortable. But you know, if you, if you wanna freeze a human bird, there's no other way you gotta use a flash. So something to consider, you know, depends on the situation, maybe talk to your, um, to your expedition leader and mention you're bringing one and see uh, how that goes or maybe talk to, your other, uh, to the other guests and see how they come forward with, but it's a, it's a handy tool. Camera straps. This is really, really important. You need good straps to be comfortable, you know, especially if you're talking long zooms, they're heavy gear, DSLRs are heavy. So it's a very important to have good straps to distribute the weight on your back. Rule number one, if it's your first time using your camera, just make sure you attach in these straps correctly. You can find that in the camera manual, you can find that on YouTube, Please, please, please make sure you run the thread correctly. Uh, it happened to me ages ago. I dropped the camera and the first time I grabbed it because the straps are not attached correctly. So be very diligent with this. If you are unsure, ask around. Even you know there's a chance your expedition leader is a photographer or likes photography or has some photography gear, you know, if you're not unsure, maybe chat with him, talk to other guests, just be sure that they are attached correctly. Here are two examples that I think works beautiful for us. So um, my personal one, I use this one on the right, the kind of shoulder, a very wide um, neoprene shoulder strap. You can find that from different brands. And I like the position of the camera, kind of upside down, it protects a little bit. Uh, but this year I was working um, again with uh, Zappa and he had this big design um, quick. And he was super happy and I've seen people around so and he's solid. So especially if you're not uh if your camera is not with a super uh heavy lens, I, I think it is a is a good strap. And you just attach it to your backpack. So if you have a nice backpack that distribute the, the, the weight evenly, it's just an accessory that I chat attach it. So I think it's a it's a great thing to have. Tripods and monopods. So tripods is hard. Most of the time it's hard to bring one on the boat, right? It's there's just so much room you can take. But also they're very handy, you know, for taking pictures around the hotel. So it's something to consider if you bring in one or not. Um something maybe, you know, if for some if for some reason you wanna take some landscape shots, you know, um when in the hotel and walking around. Um, yeah, talk to your guide, see how is the boat, if it's super full, maybe sometimes you can adjust. Um, but yeah, they're very handy. Uh, if you like landscape, I would definitely consider bringing one. Now you get carbon fiber ones, which are very light. Uh, and if you purchase in one, I would stick to the main brands like uh, Manfrotto, Gitsu, those uh, more famous ones. They're more expensive, but they're absolutely durable. I have my Manfrotto for over 20 years and it's is as new as it was, so um, it's a really good tool, maybe just not on the boat. Motopods, so they're not a bulky a tripod and they're really good for taking sharper images. So for example, if you with a really long lens and you know not the best light and you have to, you know, you, you don't have that flexibility on speed, monopods can work very well and they fit well on the boat because you can just have your monopod, you know, in between your legs and that will definitely give you sharper images. So if you if you like have more like shaky hands and you're not feeling super secure, consider bringing a, a monopod. And I personally like um, usually sorry I usually buy the the monopods and then you buy the hats separate. So I highly recommend um, these hats here on the left. They are mostly using for bird photography, but I think they work perfect for wildlife as well. So 
it enables you small moves with the camera up and down and I think they're great uh, or if you want to go simple you have this head here with a ball head which is also very handy and works very well bags and cases that's another hot topic um, I like bags and cases that can take a little bit of water maybe a light rain and they're easy so I like bags that I can open and I can see all my gear or if I'm in a rush I can just put a lens there and grab another one there's a variety of options a variety of shapes um, again I recommend you sticking to the main brands and I pre in, when you talk about backpacks I really like the systems here on the left that's the most popular one from from lower pro so I would just kind of avoid um the ones that you, the camera is basically a rucksack that you put cases inside because you know sometimes you gotta you want to get a lens and it's down in the bag and it's like oh this, you have to take stuff in and out so i like this ones that you open and the gear is there there's nothing worse than you know you, you have a lens it's deep in the bag it's like oh i don't want to open and then you miss a good opportunity so i like this one that kind of shows what inside and you can you can get easy access to it Filters, um, there's two main two main types of filters. There's a, a screw in that just attach in front of your lens and there's square filters. If you're into landscape photography, series in, you probably know what square filters are. Uh, if, you know, landscape is not your every, every day, I recommend you go in screen, uh, screen uh, filters. They're cheap. You can get in different um, diameters and you just attach them easy and they tend to be uh, cheaper as well the filter that i don't think you should come to pantanal without it is polarizer filters so polarizers they place in front of the camera lens uh, they darken the sky they they kind of take the reflections out glare and etc so if you want to get this nice blue sky of the pantanal without all the glare in the water you have to have one and also, when we fly from um, from Arara's Law to Cayman, we do a beautiful, it's an hour-long flight, and you must have a polarizer there because you're gonna get a lot of the glare from the from the plane windows, the plastic they use, and with the polarizer, it makes a huge difference. So I highly recommend getting a polarizer for your lens, especially for the uh, wider angle. And also a small observant towel. I bring a couple in my bag. They are usually to clean your hands, clean the camera, any dirt. You know, if you get just light rain, just come with sprinkle, you can kind of protect your lens and they work for everything. So, and also, you know, sometimes you can even wrap the lens. If you have to do like a quick uh, change, you can just wrap your lens on them. They kind of protect it. So I, I, I always bring a couple observant towels with me. Extra lens cap, you know, I'm really bad in that. I lose them all the time. So just bring maybe one or two extras. Remember, bring the front ones and the back ones. Uh, there's nothing worse than having a lens in your bag without lens cap. That's where you get scratches and dirt inside. So bring some extra ones. They will save you some time. And just, you know, nowadays you can get off-brand ones. They're very cheap. And I really recommend you having some extra ones. And... Uh, here is my uh, go-to kit. So when I'm guiding, that's what I bring with me. So I like bringing two cameras. By no means you must have, but for me, it feels uh, very handy. Uh, I use a Tamron, the 17, 28 millimeters, the Sony 24, 105. That's the lens that is always mounted in my camera. Anywhere I'm going, that's the lens that I have on. Uh, also bring a 7200 and my long one the 200 600. Uh, I like to bring uh, two full batteries so I work with two bodies I always have one wide angle lens attached and one zoom lens each one with a fresh be uh, battery and I bring four memory cards so as I mentioned earlier I have the main one and I have the backup in my camera and also a case and of course polarizer filters. And the best recommendation I can give you for you to get the best shot is always be ready. The game is on once you leave your room and it just finished when you go to sleep. 
I've seen animals popping right in front of us in the most unimaginable situations, like you go to breakfast and there's a jaguar walking. It's not unheard. Or you like a hundred meters for the hotel when you get a really nice anaconda just sitting. So always be ready. Always have your camera with a battery, with a fresh battery, your cards, enough room, you know. And as I mentioned, uh, I like to have my 24105 all the time. So we go, we get all the pictures, everything. And when we're driving back, I kind of put down my, my big lens and I carry with me the 24105, which is a super flexible lens. And it's really, really cool because that gives me the flexibility to go wide if I need longer zoom i have the, the 100 millimeters so you know that thing when you think the day is done and you pack your camera in the bag don't do that because you're going to miss some amazing opportunities and also test and try all your gear before traveling if it's new gear make sure to download a copy of the manual on your phone or bring a hard copy whatever you prefer but please, please, please don't leave for the last day. Don't try to use your camera the first time when you get to the hotel in Sao Paulo, because it may, it may be hard and you may not be able to take the most of your gear. So try to play around at least a couple of days before flying in. Then you're familiar, you know how the things, of course, if you need some help, if you have some questions, it's always around. We, we do our best to try and help you. But it's it's very important that you're familiar with it. And the manual is an amazing resource to bring with you. It's incredible how much information you can find in those, even like from basically photography rules, how to meter the light, even to composition, plus all the adjustments in your camera. So they're, I know not a lot of people write, like to read in them, but they're very, very handy tool to have. And I thank you so much. Um, yeah, I ho uh, hope you guys enjoy. And please, uh, if you have any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. Fernando, thank you so much. That is a, what you just gave us was a budding photographer's dream. So much information. <laughs> um, I think I might be able to even have some success out there with all that info. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. Um, we do have some time for questions. So let's start with what is your opinion about buying used lenses? Is that a risk? Is it just context dependent? Um, I, I have no problem in buying used lenses. Um, if you like, I, I'm a I'm a full time uh, image maker, so it, it's part of my everyday dealing with lenses. If you're just a hobbyist and you want to try different ones, I see no problem buying second hand, second hand lens, but I will stick to the ones you can buy from the shop because they offer you some warranty. So BH, Adorama, and those places, they have a use it section. So they, they, they put a very clear explanation of what's the state of the gear. They give you some sort of warranty. So um, I see no problem in doing that. And maybe you no, know, even on eBay, sometimes you see seller they are very well qualified, and you see they're very very diligent in describing the lens and etc. So I don't see a problem. I would just avoid, you know, if you're buying a lens from someone you've never seen, you don't know what's the background of that lens because it's it's very hard to see what's inside, right? So I would avoid buying from private parties. But uh, if you if it's a like a good a vendor or or if a shop, I definitely see no problem. Okay. Is there a special case that you're aware of for lithium batteries, sort of like a Faraday box? I never heard uh, about that. What I try to do, um, the care, the batteries, especially the the most the uh, the main brand one, when you buy, it comes a battery and it has like a a, a small kind of plastic thing that kind of shields the contacts. So usually that's uh, more than enough for transporting. And I just choose any case that, you know, the battery is not going to be rocking inside. And I'm sure that's not going to get, the, no water or humidity will get in. So um, I don't know any, any case like that, but anything that kind of protects it and kind of especially protects the contact between a battery and the other one. 
Okay. Do you need an adapter to attach the Nikon lens to your Sony camera? Yes. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. That's a really good question. So nowadays you can get adapters. So uh, you can definitely get uh, use Nikon lens uh, in your Sony cameras. You can use Canon lens in your Sony cameras. What you can get, you're not going to be able to get an adapter to use your Canon lens in your Nikon camera. And I think vice versa. So there are adapters out there. Most of them work well. You you will find different adapters. Some give you autofocus, some don't. Um, some some depends on the brand and the adapter. They may limit the features on your lens and etc. But it's a really good alternative. And sometimes you just want to change your camera brand and you want to stick to your glass. So yeah, adapters are are really handy. And it definitely can use a Nikon on Nikon glass on some cameras. Okay. Well, that's the last question we have time for today. So I will hand it back to you for some closing comments. Yeah, uh, I really hope that this um, will help you, you know, deciding what the gear you want to bring. The Pantanal is an amazing place and there's opportunities like all the time. It's almost overwhelming. Like you're going to have the opportunity to see beautiful landscape, beautiful animals many times. So. Just be sure that you bring in the gear to achieve the results you're looking for. Test the gear. Remember to bring a copy of the manual. That's very handy. And you know we'll be on your side, and we're gonna try to you know help you the best as we can. And I'm sure uh, if you come to Pantanal, you're gonna have an amazing expedition. Thank you again, Fernando, for taking the time to present for us today and sharing all of your secrets. Again, that was just a very informative, I'm sure very helpful uh, presentation for all of our aspiring photographers out there and, and probably for a lot of professionals as well. Um, I wanna thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye.